the history program with uh, me, Tony Brown from the Limerick Historical Society, and uh, Tom Donovan. Uh, we have with us this evening. We have uh, with us uh, Patrick Walden, Paddy Walden, from all the way from Ballina, out in County Tipperary, not the Ballina now in Mayo. Paddy, you're welcome along to the program. Thank you very much, Tony. Now we we'll, uh, we we'll just uh, we we'll, all these are things we can talk about, sir. Uh, the different subject, but what I really want, well, what I think, if you want to talk about something else, you can at any time. Brought in, but um, I should say first of all, I should mention your position within the within the Kilrush Historical Society. I am right. one of the founder members of the Kilrush and District Historical Society, and I'm the PRO, and I got roped in because I have lots of family connections in Kilrush and Kilrush, the area yeah. around Kilrush back to Duped and up to Dunpeg and beyond. Harry Gold. Harry Gold, exactly. Yeah, I know that because I went with you once or twice. We went down to Kilkee in that, in that general area. Anyway, uh, but uh, we won't talk about Kilrush. I wouldn't have the neck to talk about Kilrush. I'd stick to Limerick because uh, I, wouldn't, well, I don't think anybody should go out of their own bailiwick. You kind of uh, you need local talent. For You're very local. welcome. Anytime you want to come to Kilrush and learn about it. Oh yeah, I am. But you still you need. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't have as neck as much neck as I have now. I wouldn't have that kind of neck. Would you, Tom? Now imagine me doing a, a tour of of Glen, You know what would you think, Tom? Well, you you wouldn't get past the, you wouldn't get past Slough and Church, and so you'd be picked off. <laughs> yeah, you see that. Uh, well, you can have facts. Any clown can yeah. study facts. And you but I, I, I could do I could do a talk on on Kid Dysons would say, but I wouldn't know enough. Like you'd have to have somebody there with you that would know uh, the area, like you know. I had I had that debate with a, a lady one night about she organized an outing to uh, an area and I said to her that she should have included not me now, another person and she took umbrage to it, but I said like you can't beat local knowledge, you know. I mean the person who lives in the locality will have the little nuances that you can add in, you know. Yeah. Okay. Who fell out a window and who who banged his car and all these and didn't they make for local? Well, even, even, even on Clarina, no, I wouldn't like I'm I'm here 40 years, but I'm still a blow in and like I How wouldn't you? have the knowledge now that, that Mike McNamara or Desi Fitzgerald would have, like you know, um, and and I'd say Paddy, when well, Paddy has been living, uh, he, he's up like he spent most of his time down in Carrigo Holt as a a youth is the word, I suppose. You spent your holidays in Carrigo Hall, Paddy, didn't you? I did for many years, yeah, for about 25 years. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you'd you you be familiar with the area? I'd be pretty familiar with Carrigo Hall, yeah. yeah. My and knowledge you, like, of Kilrush is more book, book knowledge and talk yeah, to locals yeah, in more recent yeah, years. Yeah. 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 Well, you, you have two things. You, you, have the book, you have book knowledge, which you read, and then by yeah. reading you know, locals, and they'll tell you like what happened, and they'll have memories they got from their parents, and all that. That's what makes, brings history to life, really, you know, and add into things that you've learned, you know. Yeah. You have yeah. to combine the the oral tradition with with the written records. That is true. Yeah. That's what I like, you know. Well, you I, could, you know like for example, Penny, I only discovered, John Corton gave me a biography of Scott of the Antarctic there recently, and I, he, he pointed out to me that that he, one, one of the areas he explored was Clarina Castle. He visited Clarina Castle, you know, which I never knew. Like, as a young fellow in the shop said to my wife the other day, every day is a school day, you know. She said, I didn't know that. And he said, every day is a school day. And it is, you know, I mean, you never know everything about, no matter what it is, you'll always find something new, yeah. you know. But, that's true, you know, that's true. Anyway. Here, anyway, Paddy, this, this, is, this is about you, not about us, so you start talking, you can talk. What, what would you talk about? Yeah, that's, that's it. it. How, how did you, like, uh, like how did a, a Jackie, Dublin Jackie in, in Dub, down in Kilrush and involved in Kilrush and Sarkis Societies? Tell us, like, how you, I started off by saying you went to, you used to go to Carrigan Hall on holidays, but just tell us, like, Tony and I know, but just tell, like, tell us how you got involved in Kilrush. I decided about 20 years ago that I could work in Dublin for another 30 years to pay for a house in Dublin, or I could take the deposit I'd saved up to buy the house in Dublin, come down the country and buy a house and not have to work for 30 years to pay off a mortgage. Yeah. So I actually yeah. came to live in Ballina, as Tony said. 
And uh, then about 12 years ago, I got involved in Facebook and somebody told me there was a Kilrush local history group on Facebook and I signed up for that. And the next thing I was roped into Kieran Old Graveyards. And yeah. uh, I came up with the idea actually of hosting the National Famine Commemoration at Kilrush. Oh, yeah. Somehow we managed to bring that up in 2013. We had Michael D gave us a wonderful speech. And yeah. uh, there was a, a huge Michael, community Michael turn, D, Michael turnout D, Michael all D, over West Michael Clare. Michael D gets around, doesn't that. That? Michael, yeah. Michael D gets around. He gets around. Michael yeah. D Higgins. Yeah. But um, was, was Georgie Harrod there at that time? George, George was Harris dead at this was, stage. And really, what got us yes. going was trying to resuscitate the work that George had done. Yeah. Um, yeah. He'd been involved in transcribing tombstones, all sorts of things. Yeah. Right. He, he was ahead of his time. like like He was like Jerry McMahon and Arda, uh, you know, people who transcribed headstones back before yeah. internet or anything, you know, yeah. and did the hard work. Actually, uh, I got a lovely have... video a couple of weeks ago from America from a lady who came over in 1989, I think it was, and arranged mm -hmm. an appointment with George to discuss her ancestry and video yeah. recorded the whole thing. And she's just digitized oh, okay. it and sent it back to me. So. Oh, I don't George, who? The transcribed yeah. graveyards yeah. and parish registers and all sorts of other records. And they had it was based in the youth center in the rush. And um, how did a local name now in uh, in, in Kilrush? No, I think his mother was from Kilrush and went to England, I think, and married Mr. Harrod in England and then came home. Yeah, definitely yeah. not a local yeah. name. And how did you? He had a great knowledge. He had a great knowledge of the yeah. grave. Like I spent a day going around with him now to different churches and graveyards, and he had a wonderful. Like he, he could pick out the unusual. He had a, you know, he he could bring you into a graveyard and he'd show you the, the important ones. You know, he could cut to the chase and show you. Yeah. You didn't have to walk around the whole graveyard. You know, uh, I don't think I was ever in a graveyard with him. I only met him once or twice. And Real oh, life. Yeah, yeah. But I remember mm -hmm. somebody asked me the other day what was one of the great early breakthroughs I had in tracing my own family history. And when yeah. he was transcribing Kiltanan Graveyard, which is between my Asta and Dunbeg, yeah. he managed to unearth tombstones that had been buried under six inches of turf for a hundred years, maybe, and just rolled back the sod off the top of the graveyard. And one of them was my great 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 grandfather's tombstone from 1837. But Probably hadn't been was, seen was, that, was that Birmingham? Was that Birmingham? No, Galvin. Was that a Bir Galvin. was that a Birmingham grave or a Walden grave? It was it was a Galvin grave on my father's mother's side, the West Clare side. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But when I went to a graveyard one time a few years ago, and the guy was she was she Miss Hegarty? She was the librarian in Kilkee. Was she Hegarty? A name like Mary that. Teresa Hines, I'm sure. Hines, yeah. Anyway, she came with us and we went to a graveyard. I remember we, who was on the trip now with Jim Kemi and Kevin Hennon. And we were in this that, wasn't, that wasn't today nor yesterday, no, because no, 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 those are with us for a long yeah. number of years. But we were in, I it showed us at home. I thought you know, she was head with what which you was before. Well, the librarian in Kilkee for my entire youth up to she died in the late 80s was Mary Teresa Hines. And I Anyway, and you were, we were very in, well. I don't know what graveyard we were in, but I remember it was the first time uh, that I seen uh, inscribed what the trade was on a headstone. For example, if you were well, I'm probably making this up now. If he was a if he was a painter, you'd have had a ladder, and if he was a uh, so you know, easily. And I remember that, that they were very well done. Well, I don't know what graveyard would have been. It was obviously around Kilrush Kiki. <laughs> That's very common in, in West Clare, that sort of yeah. iconography. The symbols of the passion, but then the symbols of the trade of the deceased. So need, if it was a boat, then you'd have a boat to... with sails. If it was a carpenter, you'd have yeah. a carpenter's yeah. tools and yeah. so on. A blacksmith would have something as well and various things. But yeah. I remember Tim Kelly passed a comment her. She said, I'm the lovely headstones. <laughs> I always remember Kimmy saying, Yeah, this is Kelly. 
the most of had money. Some some great lad she was looking at some heads on. And Kerry put it down to to what would I say anti so anti socialism. You know, they had plenty of money, says Kerry, if they were able to do that. Whatever headstone we'd seen, I forget. I forget now. God, it must be thirty years ago and more. You know, it must be. Mary Teresa's dead more than thirty years. <laughs> and Jim Kerry is dead twenty four years. Yeah. God, because I remember we collected her actually that day uh, at the uh, at the library in in yeah. Kiki. The Sweeney, the Sweeney Memorial Library. She was very helpful that lady. I, I met her. She was yeah, very good. But anyway, that's only a by the way. But like that, the heads. I always remember the headstones. The first time I copped down to decoration on headstones. I mean, we're all familiar with the cock getting out of the pot. You know, and there's a few other ones that you see kind of all the time. But these ones, the graveyard actually was on the left hand side of the road yeah. and it was going on to um going on to the sea, I think. We were, we were in there with Paddy Paddy Nolan as well. Paddy yeah, Nolan. Could our, it could be be that uh, no, it's on Farahi, no, no. In my art, it could be. So that yeah. back in the peninsula everywhere is going on to the sea. Yeah, you're never more than a mile from the sea once you go west of your route. Yeah, you know, talking about that. But anyway, tell, tell me this, Penny. DNA. Um, first of all, just to, I mean, I'm, I'm a gist, I don't know much about DNA, but what is it? What, what is it? Explain what it is and how you go about it. DNA is in every cell of the body of every living creature and it's inherited by children from their parents with some changes so it's of great help in tracing family histories and it's broken down into four different components which each have their own inheritance path so the easiest to understand is probably the white chromosome which goes from father to son exactly like the surname Go back a second you said you inherited from your parents with some changes what do you mean by some changes well, it's like you're copying something and your typist occasionally gets one letter wrong and what's being copied. Um, so those are mutations, they're called. But also when you inherit your father's DNA, you get just half the DNA that you're half of what they call the autosomal DNA, which your father had, and half of your mother's autosomal DNA. So the half that you get is picked at random from whatever your father has. So you and your brother each have half of your father's DNA, but not the same half. Take that in now a minute. I, I, I have that taken in now. You're half, but, half of you is your father, half of you is your mother. Yeah. And the same for your brother. Yeah, and there's not exactly the same half. That, every, apart from identical twins, everyone is unique in DNA terms. How, how would it affect twins now? There are twins on next door to me. So what were they fixed as regards DNA? Uh, you come from a sperm fertilizing an egg. Two identical twins come from a sperm fertilizing an egg and splitting after the fertilization. So the DNA is identical. But if you have fraternal twins, um, two different sperm fertilize two different eggs. So it's no different than two siblings born at different times. Yeah, and how would it affect now? I'm just thinking of twins, but both of them are dead now. I knew twins one time, two males. They were completely different, chalk and cheese in every way. They and were then, probably fraternal twins. Probably no closer related than brothers born at different times. In my case, my grandfather was an identical twin. So that complicates the analysis when I look at them by comparison to my second cousins. Because in DNA terms, we have the same grandfather. Our grandfathers came out of the same egg, fertilized by the same sperm with exactly the same DNA. So well, they look be, like the same person, not just like brothers. Yeah, if one was a female and one was a male, is that the same thing then? If twins were born... Identical, identical twins have to have the same gender. The gender is determined by the sperm, which has the Y chromosome or an X chromosome. So if you have twins, a male and a female, you immediately know they're fraternal, they're not identical. And they're no more closely related genetically than a brother and a sister born in different years. Uh, Tom, I think we have to finish here, Uri. I'm, I'm getting <laughs> confused. <laughs> but anyway. Confused, confused.com. But Paddy, have you any, like, I, I had a story recently of somebody 
who were shocked by the results of a DNA test. You know, but have you any stories of people, you know, being connected through DNA, you know, away from oh, the dozens, scientific... Oh, dozens society? and dozens of stories. There's, yeah. there's no such thing as family secrets anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the, the best story I was involved in solving, because it's the one that took the longest, and in the end it was obvious, um, a family in California contacted me. And they said, we're looking for our grandfather. All we know is his name was Eugene Lynch and he was born in Ireland. Can you help? And I looked at their DNA and I compared it to the DNA. They contacted me because they had redeemed to have DNA which matched people from West Clare. And I was able to say, looking at the people they matched, I can tell you not only that your grandfather was from Ireland, but that your ancestors were from Clare and that they were from West Clare and that they were from the townland of Moveen West and that they were from this particular house because there was a Michael Lynch married to a Mary O'D and they shared DNA on both the Lynch side and the O'D side. So they had to be descended from Michael Lynch and Mary O'D. And based on Eugene's dates, he was born in the 1860s and Michael Lynch and Mary O'D were having their children around the 1860s. 20s, he had almost certainly was going to be their grandchild. So we just had to look and see which of the sons of Michael Lynch and Mary O'Dea was Eugene's father. And we looked at that puzzle for two or three years, and they came over in two different visits to see their ancestral homeland. And on the last visit, I took them back to, to Kilbaha to the church in the Little Ark. And they told us that they were devoutly lapsed Catholics, but they started um, lighting candles when they came to the church. I'm sure most people listening to this know the story of how Marcus Keane, the landlord, refused to allow mass to be celebrated yeah. on his estate, and it was celebrated in this little wooden box on the shore in Kilbaha, which is still in the church there. So I was driving home, we said our goodbyes, then we're going back to, or going up to Galway to meet cousins on the other side of the family, and I was going home. Um, I was with my friend Michael O'Connell, and mile or two up the road, I suddenly had this flash of inspiration. We're looking for Eugene Lynch's father for the last three years and we can't find him. And I said, what if Eugene Lynch was using his mother's surname? What if he wasn't, didn't have a Lynch father, but had a Lynch mother? So what I was thinking at the time was, well, maybe he was born to a single mother and took his mother's surname. And I started going through records for workhouses and parish registers looking for Lynch children born to single mothers. And um, then I had, then I looked at, at uh, the white chromosome results, the DNA results pointing towards the surname. And I noticed that Michael Lynch in California had lots of DNA matches with names like Curry and O'Curry and Curry and Corey. And I thought of Eugene O'Curry, the famous historian. Mm -hmm. And I said, what if Eugene Lynch was Eugene O'Curry? And I looked at the family tree and I discovered Michael Lynch and Mary O'Dea had a daughter, Mary Lynch, who married Thomas Curry, and they had a son called Eugene Curry, Corey, Corey, however you pronounce it, born exactly when we thought Eugene Lynch was born. And then I started looking at what I could find about this Eugene Curry born in Lislanahan outside Kilkee in the late 1860s. And I discovered that he went off to Connecticut, New York, married a neighbor up the road, had two children. And then they decided they were going to move out to California. And he said, I'll go first. I've got us a place to live and I'll send for you when I have a place for you to stay. And they never heard from him again. So it all suddenly fell into place. Eugene Lynch had abandoned his family in New York in about 1900, gone to California, changed his name, took the most obvious surname, his mother's maiden name, it was Eugene Curry in New York. It was Eugene Lynch when he got to California. And his secret was finally out in the open after 100, almost 110 years. And then with yeah. the second family, as Eugene Lynch, he did exactly the same thing. He had three or four children, and then he abandoned that family. And we're still looking for the third family. But without DNA comparison, without the Y DNA that told us his surname, and without the autosomal DNA that told us he was related to both the Lynches and the ODs and the O'Curries, we'd never have it's solved like, that. And it's like that, film, it's like that film, like, Catch Me If You Can. Yeah. It's like the film, Catch, Catch Me If You Can, you know. 
So we're, we're still looking for the third family. So anyone listening yeah. to this who has a mystery ancestor who appeared out of nowhere sometime just after the 1910 census and his DNA matches well, to Lynch's well, actually, and ODs, let us know. Ma Martin Halpin sent me a marriage of a McMahon Fitzgerald in Lachlan in the 1870s and the occupation of the father of uh, Mary Fitzgerald was uh, Knight of Glynn. She, yeah. she put down... That he, no, it obviously wasn't legitimate. Uh, you know, she was marrying um, a labourer called Fist, uh, McMahon, but uh, but she she put down the fact that she was Nigel's daughter, and you know, on, on the I suppose everybody knew it. It was she wasn't. They didn't DNA, need DNA back then to know that they were legitimate children. You know, uh, but I thought it was interesting that you know she was in tw she was around twenty and she put down the fact that she was still the Nigel's really? daughter. In some she, places, every everyone knows about the illegitimate children, but in most yeah. cases, everyone knows about the illegitimate children except the two families immediately involved. Yeah. So that was an, a, another case that I solved with DNA. Um, in my own family, my great grandmother's brother was a, a pillar of society, as far as I knew from the stories I heard about him growing up. But never met him; he died before I was born. And about fifteen years ago, I heard of the grapevine that he had. I knew he had 13 children with his wife, many of whom died in infancy, and one died in a, in a fire, actually, in Limerick. Um, but I heard there was another one on the wrong side of the blanket, as they would say. And I refused to believe the gossip. Mm. And the next thing, I had a DNA match with the daughter of that child born on the wrong side of the blanket. Mm. And she knew nothing. Her father didn't know who his father was. Her grandfather... And his legitimate children didn't know that he had another child, but everyone else in town knew about it. Yeah. yeah. No. yeah. I should get into this more, more like a cause murder. You know, I'd love to cause trouble now with all them, you know. Mm. Like, you have I, to handle all these things very carefully and very sensitively because yeah. you don't know yeah. how, how you're going to react and how other people are going to react. No, no, you yeah. have. Like, don't I've get into get it if you're into it. For causing trouble, only get into it if you're prepared to be sympathetic I, I, and understanding. I, I, like you have both to, sides. you know, yeah. it's like it's like killing a horse. I always say, I always say, you know, you may be related to Nigel Clean, but maybe not in the way you know. I like, I'd never say, you know, your your grandfather was illegitimate, or you, you know, let them. It's like like I say, killing a horse. Let them let them say it themselves. You know. Um, yeah. I remember they, even in these liberated times, people can still be a bit miffed. Uh, as Paddy says there, you know, yeah. they have this image of their uh, old, old granny who was just, you know, saying the rosary every day and never would do a, t a thing like that. Then all of a sudden they find there in black and white that she she wasn't the devout person or, you know, I mean, if, if, it's just... I remember, do you remember, yeah. you both of you remember Nishi Cleary about the... Yeah. In, in yeah, I know who he was. Again, I, I don't think I ever yeah. met the man in person. Yeah, no, I know him well. Okay, anyway, he he told me a quick story. He told me about a priest that came to one time from a, uh, he was over an hour, which I won't mention. And he said this, he wanted to find out information from Asia. And Asia went to look anywhere and found out. He said, "Take me a while to find out." Now at that time, there's no DNA, as you can remember. There was only lists of uh, on, on ships in that who went. So there was no computers even. No, no. there was Everything was being written down. But Nishi found anyway who he was. And to make your own story sharp again, not so far back, I think it was only his grandfather, going back two generations, that he was, that this, this priest would have been illegitimate from his grandfather and uh, from his grandmother. I don't, I don't anyway, the gist of the story was anyway. That Nancy said to him, you might, do you realize now what I'm, I'm about to tell you? Like, you're breaking him down slowly to tell him, you know. And he said to him, when he explained to him, he showed him on what records he had, what Paris trust records he had. And the priest says, looked at it and said, okay, thank you. How much do I owe? And Nancy said, you can put something into the box. Nancy told me that this priest had already had known this and just wanted some bit of proof from the, the Colophon Center. And uh, when, Ishi, when Ishi could show him that it was more or less true, that was it. He just went in after that. He didn't say another word to Nishi, he just went. Uh, Nishi, he definitely knew something. 
and he just wanted to kind of prove to him that. Uh, well, that he told me a story, this theory, that he, uh, he showed me different regs. Yeah, yeah, and also he, he wanted to want somebody else telling him that, you know. So they should just say to him uh, that, that, that there's what you need to know and showed him what he had. And when he found it, he just said, thank you, we went, you know. Because some people can take, can, like, one, one, they'll, they'll, they'll argue with you. You see a lot of programs where people find out they had cousins they never knew. And uh, as you said, it was said a few minutes ago, some people are delighted when they find out. I'm sure Americans are, Australians would be. Yeah. Especially if they've never been to Ireland to find out that they have somebody. They'd be overjoyed. But how do you tell that to somebody from a, from a, a working class area here in Limerick that they've caused us up the road? You know, because yeah. I really got into trouble one time now in a village in County Limerick when I heard the name from this young one. And I just happened to say to her, you were an unusual name. For the village. Oh no, she said, there's other people with the same name. And I said to her, I said, oh, I just have been passing, it's amazing you're not related. Mm. I met that young one about a week later and she said, My mother wants to meet <laughs> my mother wants to meet you. I never knew we were related. And I told another person who said, I hope we didn't tell her because they fell out about 40 years ago. They don't talk at all. And there was me starting trouble. Telling this young one they were related, and you can it can happen in two seconds, you see. So people yeah. I've come across many cases of two families living in the same street, as they'd say, with the mm. same surname, the same we're not related. Yeah. yeah. It might fall down to a family row a few generations back. Yeah, yeah. Or sometimes um the, the sense of being related was are you so closely related you need a dispensation to get married? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. So not, yeah. Not related, or they might say the relationship is gone if the relationship is more distant than third cousins. If anything more distant than third cousins didn't need a dispensation to marry in the, in the Catholic Church. Yeah, yeah. But still, yeah. here, um, God, I, I won't, I can take a family now, we'll discuss some other time. But like that, you, you'd wonder where does this leave then, that, for example, as regards first cousins and second cousins, if you don't know. Well, does that lead to problems with DNA? Well, the, well, the lady that's my, she's my second cousin once removed now, the lady whose father didn't know his father, she told me that when she was grown up, her father said, I don't know who my father was. If you married somebody around here, you could be marrying your half yeah. first cousin without realizing it. Maybe you should emigrate. He said that to his three children. And they all mm -hmm. emigrated. And actually, she told me recently about a guy who was chasing her sister, who's still around. And uh, I said, they were second cousins. And mm -hmm. they didn't realize it. And they could have ended up getting married if she hadn't ever graced. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sure it happens. I mean, pre DNA. Oh, like, I, I mean, I've heard another yeah. story. It might be apocryphal now about a couple that were about to announce their engagement until their father decided he'd better come clean. Yeah. Tell them they were half brother and half sister. Yeah. <laughs> What, what you worry about is, is the blue blood syndrome, if, if I can call it that. And uh, it's, it's bad, you know, it can lead to problems within, within health. But what is, what is, I know we get off the subject now, what is going to happen in the future when there are so many children being born who are wedlock and that, and, uh, and parents splitting up and remarrying and that, you know? Is this going to lead to problems with DNA? An awful lot of those of unknown parentage, whether they be adopted or born to single mothers or born by sperm donation or whatever. They are enormously curious for personal reasons and sometimes because they want to know their family medical history uh, to know who were their genetic parents and definitely a disproportionate people using the DNA comparison websites or people with unknown parentage, either themselves or further back in their family tree. So if you do submit your DNA to these databases, you're going to be contacted by adoptees Ooh. and children yeah. of single mothers and children of sperm donors, trying but to figure out, am, am I your third cousin or your fourth cousin, or yeah. maybe am I closer? Well, I, I, had a, I had a query come back about 20 years ago um, from a, a child of a foundling. He was a, found, a foundling meaning the child was abandoned at birth and uh, people knew who the mother was and people, knew, locally people knew who the mother was and who the father was, you know, from, 
And my uncle told me who this woman's uh, grandparents were, but uh, I couldn't. And she kept writing to me and ringing me and saying, I know you know, but I couldn't tell her because she would approach the family then who, you know, I know yeah. proof only from local gossip or folklore. And I couldn't. Well, as our politicians are trying to learn, there are two very different rights. There's the right to knowledge, and there's the right to contact. Well, that's 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 the the the, the, the that's the nub of it, there, Paddy. You know, and there, everyone has the right to knowledge, but yeah, no one has the right to contact if the other side doesn't want to be contacted. I, I know, I know. A friend of and my mother's. We can uh, we can see the she, trauma our politicians are going through trying to draft a law that acknowledges that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all very well for politicians and civil activists coming out and saying, oh, no, these people have the right to know. But you, like, my mother had a friend who gave up a child. At, uh, she's, she's, the woman is dead now, but she gave up a child for adoption, got married. Her husband and her family didn't know what didn't know about that child. So, like, if she was still alive, would you, you know, would you allow her to be, her privacy to be, to be invaded to, for the sake of to Trump? her privacy over, you know, it's a difficult. Yeah, there are some about. jurisdictions that try to outlaw DNA comparison for that very reason. But the, the genie is out of the bottle since the new technology has developed and, and there's no such thing as a family secret anymore because DNA will reveal it eventually. It might take 110 years like in the Californian case. What's that, Benny? Which, uh, or the case you were talking about, is it? The case I was talking about earlier, of Eugene Lynch, yeah. who, who, who used to be Eugene yeah. Curry. Uh, I mean, I'd love to get it done, but I would have had. Do you remember there was some man who gave out these things before? And I found it revolting having to, to basically spit it into a container. I, I wouldn't like that, you know. And uh, You only have to do it once and it takes a minute. Yeah. But the container is well sealed. Nobody else is going to go near your spit because if somebody else puts their finger in it, somebody else's DNA would be mixed in with yours. What is that? Is that Especially with COVID. With COVID, COVID yeah. yeah. You're, you're, safe, you're safe now with COVID. Yeah, but to find out his mind, you definitely stay away from it. But listen, uh, what about, is that, I thought it was taken from the inside of the mouth as well. There's two different technologies. One is from saliva spit into a tube, and the other is like like the COVID swab, swab test. Swab. You, except yeah. you don't have to put it up your nose or down your throat. You just rub the inside of your cheek with a little cotton bud and put it into a preservative solution in a little capsule and send it off. But Penny, I did my, I did the DNA test, and I, I don't recast the expressions of my father, but I got connections down in West Cork and everything, uh, which close connections. And I, I've like I have researched all my family and I, I can't I can't find any connections, you know, why I, I don't know why I would have connections in in West Cork. Well it depends on what you mean by close. Um, in the early days you mightn't have anyone in the system who was closer than your fourth or fifth or sixth cousin. So they might mm. appear towards the top of your list of matches, but actually be very distant cousins. Maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. But if the, they measure the amount of shared DNA in what's called centimorgans, and if the number of centimorgans is over 100, that's close, and you'll be able to find the connection. It won't be any further out than third or maybe fourth cousin. Yeah. But if they're near the top of the list and they're only sharing 50 centimorgans, that could be sixth or seventh cousins. So oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. even yeah. more distant. That probably, that probably explains it, yeah. Yeah. Again, I've been smart. Just supposing I was to get a DNA test done today and my brother gets one done. How close are we together then with matches? If, if um, Well, you because your brother's with the same father, you have the same surname and you have the same white chromosome, except maybe there might be one or two mutations different between you. But in terms of autosomal DNA, which comes half from your father and half from your mother, you each have half of your father's DNA, but not the same half. You each have half of your mother's DNA, but not the same half. So your very close matches will be the same, your first and second cousins. But when you get out to third and fourth cousins, you'll match some of them, he'll match some of them, some of them you'll both match, some of them neither of you might match. It's fascinating. So the results for siblings will be similar, but not identical. 
Yeah. I like I would say what was in Tom Tom Donovan's mind a while ago now, like mine. I'd be afraid in case I get cousins coming to the door that I didn't know. And they they'd say they're my relatives. Sure. They want to share your inheritance. There, well, yeah, there, there, there is a fear out there about inheritance. But most people don't understand it obviously lies that you and inheritance laws when a child is adopted that extinguishes all legal rights to the estates of the birth parents and replaces them with the same rights to the estates of the adoptive parents. Yeah. So if you find somebody in your family gave a baby up for adoption, you've absolutely no fears about inheritance. But if you, but if you have an illegitimate cousin, we'll say, or like an illegitimate half-brother, uh, do they have inheritance rights? Yes. Like if, if, well, you, if, you if don't fact, anymore like if, because the word illegitimate has been removed from legislation. Well, so, I know, I know. Uh, I, children not, who have not been adopted I, have the same inheritance rights, whether they were born to married parents or to unmarried parents. Yeah. Well, I, I read I read of a, a sad suicide case there where a man um, discovered that there was a, he, had a, he was a farmer and discovered that he, uh, a girl he went over became pregnant. And he was afraid that, that this person would come back and take the farm from him or from his son, who he had grown, grown up with. And it, it played on his mind. So uh, I was just wondering, is, is that true? Like, that the, you know, well, like even though his son worked on the farm all his life, I, I know we're going into legalities now, but the... the well, if there's, I, if there's know, two children, legit. at best, each of them has the right to half of the estate. And if there's yeah, a will... In, in a matter... In a matter in a marriage situation, like the wife would have to contribute to to the farm, maybe, or you know, to to get. You'd imagine that the the son who has worked on the farm all his life would have his rights would trump the the son who's has nothing to do with the farm. But there are provisions in law, I think, where you where you can argue that. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, the half the half brother See, would still have. I think some claim, I think under the Succession Act, um, has to be some provision, certainly for the spouse, and I think for all the children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very awkward. Really, really awkward. Uh, Patty, if somebody was interested now in getting DNA done, now, like watching us or watching whenever the programme is up, what do they do? Who do they get in touch with? Well, if you want to find relatives, you want to be in the database with the most people and at the moment that's the one run by ancestry dna no, no hold on hold on what do you do first what do i do to go about this dna to get it done i mean you so pick I'll... one of the companies which runs a dna comparison website and at the risk of be being commercial i say the one you should start with is ancestry dna because it now has over 20 million people in its database and you go to their website and you watch the prices because like all these big companies, the prices vary depending on where you are and when you order and there are sale periods. And you might pay more if you order from Ireland than if you order from America. But you order a kit online and it comes in the post and you spit into the test tube and you post it back and you wait about a month and then you get an email to say, we have a list of your DNA matches. And you look to see, are there people you know or people you don't know or is there any of your close relatives who've done it already? And those will be relatives on both your father's side and your mother's side through all your grandparents, and through all your great grandparents. The other thing is you might be interested in your surname. So if you're only interested in your Brown cousins or your Donovan cousins or your Waldron cousins, then you want just your white chromosome analyzed, which is the part of the DNA that passes from father to son like the surname. And the only company that does matching on the white chromosome for surname studies is familytreedna.com. So same procedure, you go to their website, you order, uh, and it's slightly more expensive, you order either the basic 37 marker Y-DNA analysis, which is a little over $100, I think, or the big Y-700 Y chromosome analysis is three or $400. And they send you, Ancestry send you a spit into a tube kit, Family Tree DNA sends you a cheek swab kit. That comes in the post and you send it back. Um, I actually have been kind of an agent for Family Tree DNA, so I actually have a stock of those kits. So anyone who meets me, I can hand you the kit and say, save you the postage on it. I should really get one done, you know. I really, I suppose, I'm only looking for wealthy relatives. 
if they're, if they're, if they're living in Limerick and they haven't any other one to know about them, you know, I want people that own gold mines in, in down in Calgary or somewhere, you know, that's what I'm interested in. How about you, Tom? Would you like to find Paddy, out? Paddy, Paddy has relations in Calgary, so. Who, oh, Paddy has? P Paddy has relations in, in Calgary. I have relations everywhere, but yeah, I, yeah. I once I visited that. Know that. Calgary in search of my great great grandfather who abandoned his family in Limerick and went off to Canada in the 1880s. Yeah. What is, what is his name? Paddy? William Nolan. William Nolan, yeah, yeah. He was a porn pawnbroker in Corn Market Row. I think the RTE Studios might be on the site of his pawn yeah. shop now. Was he connected with the Nelsons? Or the no the the, the pawnbrokers, the in Nelson Street. So yeah, Miles. No, most um, most of the pawnbrokers in Limerick in those days, despite what the the Frank McCourts of this world might tell us, there's other people. There were a whole dynasty of Protestant pawnbrokers around what was then called yeah. Nelson Street before Nelson yeah. was part of Bower Bree, then it became Parnell Street. It was near the railway, I think, which uh, might have been a good place for pawnbrokers, but people running out of town or arriving into yeah. town might need to some ready cash. But William Nolan was a Catholic pawnbroker. And then there were lots of Jewish money lenders and pawnbrokers in Limerick at the same time. So all denominations were trying to make a few shillings in ways that we might think were wholly respectable nowadays. Yeah, yeah. I remember Jackson's pawn office. It was, in, as you said, in a parallel state. I'd have to nearly walk onto the road now to show you the shape of the building the way it came round at an angle. Uh, it was roughly at the top of Roach Street, when you're looking up Roach Street, it was nearly facing down. And it was a big shop. I remember being, I didn't know what it was. A pawn, we didn't, I didn't know what a pawnbroker was, but this shop was full of stuff, I remember. Clocks and various things you'd see in the window. Then there was, a, the last one in Limerick, I remember was funny enough, his name was Tony Brown. And he was in Broad Street. And I remember I bought a radio from him a small little radio, and he gave me a receipt, with a receipt that from the purchase, I think I paid five pounds for this radio, so well worth it. I went in and I went up, I remember you at the counter, and he was on a box behind you, he was above looking down at you. Uh, and I remember saying to him, have a radio, oh God, he latched him uh, in, in Broad Street. And he had this little radio, he said, this is a little radio, turned it on, perfect. There's the receipt when it was bought the first time. You had to have proof of purchase, I think, when you went in with something. At that stage, I'm talking about now, we're in the late 70s here. And he gave, I bought it into a fine little radio, I remember. I had it for years. But he was the last pawn shop, as they were called, pawn offices, that I remember in Limerick. And that other one, Jackson's in Panel Street. Other than that, I don't remember any other ones around. I, I had pawn brokers on two sides of the family. Uh, my great grandfather married Polly Nolan, whose father was the pawnbroker who went off to Canada. And my great great grandfather, uh, another Thomas Waldron, married Catherine Parker. And she was related to a Parker family who had a pawn shop on yeah. what was Nelson Street in their days as well. That lasted I, almost up to your time, Tony, I think. Yeah, I think that's Parker's, all right. It became, did it become Jackson's after? Might have done eventually, yeah. But it had been in the Parker family for many generations, almost back into the 1700s, I think, Jason. Yeah. But, uh, but that, hey, that, that, Paddy, can you just explain your connection with Limerick through the Clancy's and the, and the Wadrons? My, my father was born in number four Verona Esplanade, beside St. Joseph's Church up here. Oh, Sorry, both, um, confused people. Both near the model school to George's Church. Inside the model school, exactly, yeah. In fact, they left Limerick. I should check when is the anniversary. It was more Civil War times. In 1922, there was, I think it was an industrial dispute in the post office that coincided with the, the Civil War and various post office officials were run out of town. Yeah. And my grandparents were on Verona Esplanade, and Mr. Hetherington, who was the postmaster, was beside them. And armed and masked men came to the doors in the dead of night and handed them notes saying, Get out of the town. And Hetherington knew that there was a war on and that it wasn't good when there was a knock on the door late at night. He went out the back and he climbed over the wall and 
there was a big drop down into the grounds of the model school at the back of the Rowan Esplanade houses and he jumped or he fell and he broke his leg and he was lying there all night and when he didn't come home eventually they found him uh, the next morning and he was never in the better of it but that's when the Waldrons left Limerick for Dublin I came back to not too far from Limerick 80 years later my father's mother uh, was Sis McNamara, and she was raised by her maternal uncle by George Clancy, who had a shop at 48 William Street, a big drapery shop. And that burnt down in a fire in 1913, but he got it going again. But again, the business was never the same after the fire. And my uh, father's, father's people were in the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary, for two generations. So they moved around the country quite a bit. But um, when my great-grandfather Walden retired from the RIC, he went to work as a clerk or a boarder or something in the prison in Limerick, and he lived in Fairview Terrace across the road from the prison. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, my grandparents both um, spent their formative years in Limerick, although one was born in West Clare and the other was born in Nina. His father was in the RIC in Nina. In Nina, yeah. Because you mentioned that, that fancy shop now at William Street, you know what that is, about near the top of William Street, going up. Yeah, it's it's changed. It's, it's bags and luggage or something, I think, is there now. It was a dealer for years. It's yeah. It's changed right, right. a few times in recent years. Most people would know it now as uh, it used to be Morton's. Yeah. Morton's was a big shop. They actually took in two different... Well, people of, people of our generation might remember it was Morton's, but the Morton's have been gone for decades. I don't, I don't really remember Morton's. What, what, what number is the penny? 48, is it? 48. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about the fire in 1913. 1913. There were actually, I think it was three people died in the fire. One was George Clancy's nephew, a younger George Clancy, uh, a son of the man who had the, the child on the wrong side of the blanket. Yeah, um, yeah. He was from the right side of the blanket, so he was sent to secondary school yeah. in Limerick and was living with his uncle. And then the housekeeper and some other draper's assistant or something, I think, died. But Uncle George ended up on a top floor windowsill with flames around his ankles with the RIC trying to reach him with a long ladder from the street. And I, the story is eventually one of the RIC men had to put the ladder up on his shoulders to get it the whole way up so Uncle George could climb down. He survived. Yeah. And my grandmother was uh, well married at that stage. And I just, had, I just had her second child, I think, so she moved out long before the fire. When your grandfather went to Dublin, Penny, what did he do? My grandfather and his identical twin brother, they were both post office officials. They started out as in the grade was, which was called unpaid learner. Oh, yeah. And they moved yeah. on to sorting clerk and telegraphist. Yeah. And then they slowly moved up through the ranks. And Uncle Paddy, my namesake, my great uncle, ended up as controller of the Dublin Postal District. I think he, he went further up the hierarchy than my grandfather. Yeah, and to worry about um, postal code today, just those. Those silly things they introduced. Well, the they, they had jobs like going out measuring the postman's route and estimating how much time it should take him to cycle it every morning oh, yeah. and so on. So my yeah, grandfather yeah, inspected yeah. every post office in West Limerick from that perspective in his day. Including my, including my grandfather. Probably, yeah. I, I found I showed I showed you um a record where, where he had shown where Mr. Waldron tested his um how far he could walk it, you know, if you could, you, you didn't keep your job in this, you could walk a certain yeah. amount of miles in a certain yeah. amount of time. Yeah. It's, it's, the, exactly. yeah, the opposite it's, to it's the, amazing where their names show up. Yeah, yeah. Um, the best one I found on my great grandfather's side was in uh, one of Jerry Madden's books on the Tomb Graney oh, Bodike area, yeah. where he yeah. had a story about a child that fell down a well. I was rescued by Constable Walden at the RIC in about 1879. And at the book launch of Jerry's book, 120 years later, I was introduced to the descendant of the child that my great grandfather had pulled out of the well. Oh, yeah. oh God. But, but you're, you know, you're, you're the twins, you said your um, your grandfather and his brother, they, they were in the post office then, is it? They were, yeah. Both of them, yeah. It's so, and there were any children that had your father, had your. Had your grandfather, your father, what size family did he come out of? My father was the youngest of three. He had one brother and one sister. Oh, yeah. 
and the other family, the two identical twins married two sisters, two McNamara sisters who'd grown up together in William Street. And there were five children in the other family. So they grew up together in Limerick and Dublin, like one big family. Oh, what, were the, what, were the McNamara, what trade were the McNamaras in? My great grandfather, he, he married into a farm, essentially. His, his first wife, my great grandmother, got an, an outside farm as her dowry in Moveen, west of Kilkee. Oh, so yeah. technically, he was a farmer. He was a horse trader. He'd go up to the Ballinus Low Horse Fair every year. And there were stories of how he'd ride up on one horse and he'd come home on a different horse, maybe five yeah. or ten pounds of his pocket yeah. from all the horses he traded over the weekend. And at one stage, uh, he took out a publican's license and had a pub in the house. And around the same time, maybe to generate custom for the pub, he laid out a race course around the farm. And there were people came from miles around for Johnny Max races for a few years. So. He was slightly entrepreneurial, but at the same time, I fear he might have been one of his own best customers at the pub, which didn't last yeah. very long. Yeah. Yeah. And can you explain the um, part with the Tomás de Valdraja? Tomás de Valdraja, who we all probably remember from the Valdraja's Dictionary when we studied yeah. Irish in school, was one of my father's double first cousins. His father was Uncle Paddy Waldron and his mother was Lily McNamara. We said uh, he, he was one of the twins' sons. Son of one of the twins. So he was actually, genetically, he was a little more than a double first cousin. Double first cousin was the children of two brothers who married two sisters. So yeah, you two yeah. identical twins who married two sisters, you're even closer genetically than ordinary yeah. double first cousins. Yeah. The one did inherit, which... your sister inherited anything to make the manners. You said one had been inherited to farm. I said that my great-grandmother, who was the Clancy, got yeah. this farm as her dowry from her parents, who had it as an outside farm. I have a horrible feeling it was a piece of land from whom, which a family had been evicted after the famine. Yeah. I don't like to go there. Well, yeah, there's, there's lots of land where people are evicted after the famine, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's yeah. thousands and thousands It was, it was of the other pounds. side of Kilkee from the house where she grew up, so it was... Oh, about yeah. seven or eight miles away from the main farm. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know whether they, they required it originally. I, I, I don't think they walked onto it. They, prob they probably didn't walk onto an evicted farm. It's probably years previously the people were evicted, you know. Um, yeah. Well, they didn't They didn't walk onto it because they lived about eight miles away. So that was I, a, possibly yeah. a safe distance, even if it was an evicted farm. And, yeah. But as well before the the height of the land war and the boycotting that only came in the 1880s but uh, this farm was in the Clancy family from the 1860s I think oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we're so, uh, finishing up so we time to go home uh, yeah. and in first of all anyway we we're, we're, we're have to talk more about DNA I'll probably get a few questions anyway from people who ask me about yeah. DNA uh, you'd have to, to, you have to order your own ancestry DNA kit Tony I'll, I'll give you the kid for the surname, for the Browns. I'd have to get one to find out, you know, if we're really Irish anyway, you know, find out what I can find. Well, we didn't even go there because I hate this idea of assigning ethnicity labels to our ancestors and then to yeah. our DNA. Well, anyway. I, I remember when I, I was in England and in America studying and I had to fill in a census return in both places. And the first time I'd been asked what was my race, there was a long list of boxes I could take. And then at the end was other. So I just take the other box and wrote human because the human race is the only one I can prove I belong to. Mm -hmm. I can only go back five or six generations on most sides. So yeah, yeah. I can't assign an ethnicity or a race to, to my ancestors further back than that with the companies that are selling these DNA kits. That's the market I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. Penny, I'm in shocked. America okay. for their customers are mostly the descendants of immigrants. I'm I'm shocked you can't you can't you can't go back. I thought you'd be able to go back to your know, dot. Well, some parts I can, other parts I can't. My mother's side of Mayo, I can't even tell you all my great great grandparents. But uh, were, were, were you were you connected to the Waldros and the Mantrasna murders? No, I don't think so. That the YDNA results tells us there's at least four different Waldron lineages in Ireland, totally unrelated for thousands of years. Yeah. And I, I have a horrible so, feeling. This is why I don't like ethnicity. I have a horrible feeling 
because the first occurrence of the name Waldron in Ireland, is, as I spell it, is with the Ulster Plantation in 1609. I have a horrible feeling that my surname came in with the Ulster Plantation. Right. Um, I think I did. The word the Waldron has around East Bay, around Ballyhawness, and when the Irish names mm -hmm. were being anglicised, people had heard of the Waldrons and Roscommon and Leitrim and Cavan. I, I remember. Like, I remember. It sounds a bit like the Waldron. We put that English on it. I remember. You Years ago, you sent me a photograph of um, uh, a, a police barracks in Knockvicker. Was it Knockvicker? Uh, yeah, where my, your great ancestors had... my great great grandfather is supposed to have been born in Knockvicker, but that's a black yeah. hole. I can't find a but you sent, you sent me a, you sent me a photo, and standing on the standing on the door was my wife's cousin, who lives <laughs> yeah. in the house now. <laughs> Very small world. Yeah, I said yeah, to somebody yeah. last night, yeah. I don't believe in six degrees of separation that people are always talking about. It's much less. Well, my, my father had a simpler version of that. He said, no matter who you meet, if you talk to them long enough, you'll get a connection, you know. I organized a family reunion out in Prague last week. I was talking about the Clancy man who had the, the, the child on the wrong side of the blanket. Well, one of his children from his marriage and one, one of his for, descendants wait, wait. from his marriage and one of his descendants from the other side about living in Prague and I arranged for them to meet up. Did you go to Prague? No, I didn't. I did all done by sending emails and Facebook messages. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I realised the two, the two men are in Prague, their first cousins, one half first cousins once removed, and neither of them knew the other existed until a couple of weeks ago. And I told them that they existed. I'd say they if you went to they, if you went to Beijing, if up. you went to Be if you went to Beijing, you'd find cousins. I just <laughs> with, oh, your, I knowledge, with yeah. your knowledge, yeah. yeah, there's Irish people everywhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I want to call this for heart. Penny, can we thank you for coming on? As your, as your usual uh, six months a, a long time since we last did this on the radio on Sunday night. Jeez. Uh, I, I guess Mitchell asked me when I still with that pilot station I was with. <laughs> no, we've got to be up market since, you know. Anyway, Penny, to thank you for coming on and to you, Tom. And uh, we'll talk again, Penny, and let me know what's happening in anyway, the okay? Okay, doke, and I'll see you with the DNA kit soon. Well, I'll have to come to the about it with the next month anyway. This is me, Tony Brown, from the Liberty Historical Society. And I uh, hope we, we might get back to some normality, we hope. Uh, well, this, definitely the end of this month, I hope. We have some bit of an outing. And uh, anybody wants to get in touch with for members all the time. I'm sure Kill Russia as well, anyway. You get in touch Absolutely. KDHS.ie, if you want to join us, you find the membership form there. Oh, KDHS, oh yeah, KDHS. The Russian District Historical Society. Oh, God. Anyway, you get in the, and I, I won't charge with that plug, no mind, you know. Anyway, thanks very much, everybody, for watching, and uh, to meet again, thank you very much. Good luck, Joe.